Okay. So this is the thing. Great. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you, thank you, um, all of you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Before jumping into the subject um, of today's lecture, I would like to quickly like say three things. Before jumping into the subject of today's lecture, I would like to quickly um, say three things. Um, first, I would like to thank the Gesellschaft für Interkulturelle Philosophie for having me for this event and for giving me the opportunity to talk about Busi Buraka. Uh, I owe special thanks to and gratitude to Abed Kanor and David Le Duc Tiara for thinking about me and for reaching out to me for this lecture. Thank you very much for having me. I would like to, to make uh, two positions. The first one is that, uh, unfortunately, I'm, not, I'm no longer a fellow at Harvard University, and precisely at Edmund and Linda Safra Center for Ethics and the Hutchins Center for African and African-American Research, because my fellowship came, shall I say, unfortunately, uh, to an end a couple of weeks ago on June 30th, 2022. So I don't want to feel like I'm usurping uh, uh, this position and I won't forgive myself if I were to confuse the audience either. Um, but it should be mentioned nevertheless that I cherish those centers and their communities and I share the sadness of their recent passing uh, of uh, Mrs. Lily uh, Safra, a long time benefactor of the Center of, for Ethics at Harvard University. Uh, as the second position is that I'll be using the expression Muntu in crisis, which is the title of the English rendition of Ebusi Bulaga's uh, 1977 essay published in French under the title. The original title is French and it's La crise du Muntu. Although I'll be referring uh, to this English title, I mostly disagree with the translation uh, offered by the book. So on the other hand, since I consider Muntu in crisis to be the adaptation uh, uh, of La Crise de Muntu, rather than strictly speaking, a translation of the latter book, the audience should be aware that I'm using the English title only for obvious practical reasons, uh, uh, whereas my intention is primarily to refer to the original book in French, namely La Crise de Muntu. Um, the last thing I want to say before jumping into the, the lecture is that I'm using the term critique in the title of my lecture in two ways. First, as an intensive exploration of an object of analysis, and second, as the intensive refutation of what is analyzed. Uh, in Ebu Sibulaga's Muntu in Crisis and in relation to the object of the book, namely philosophy, these two meanings are entwined as they are given at, as, at once or at the same time. What I would then try to show is one, how this critical enterprise is conducted by Ebu Sibulaga toward the concept of philosophy, which is arguably one of the key concepts of the book. And two, I would like to try to reflect on the results of this enterprise as related to one of the other key concepts of uh, Ibusi Bulaga's argument, namely authenticity. So I can say that I have three, I will ask three questions, three really naive questions. So the first and the second questions they are giving at the same time is, what is the content of Ebusi Bulaga's critical understanding of philosophy in Muntu in crisis? Whereas the third question is, is the critical intention of the book fulfilled by the author? Or to put it more simply, does Ebusi Bulaga refute philosophy in Muntu in crisis? Those are my questions. So in Africa, I would, I would first try with, uh, presenting the definition of philosophy by Ibu Sibulaga. So Ibu Sibulaga holds that philosophy is an attribute of power, especially of Western power. He writes, I quote, philosophy is an attribute of power. Now the West is its proprietor and its distributor. This is the page two of uh, Muntu in Crisis, the English version. 
of course. So in Africa and with regard to African texts, um, the context of the term philosophy is power, according to, to Busi Bulaga. Its context is coloniality. The distribution of the sensible that takes place within philosophy is that of the colonial boundaries between humanity and non or subhumanity. What is at stake in the African claim to possess philosophy then is the inclusion of Africans in the realm of humanity, which is to say uh, that they have been excluded from it uh, in the first place, an exclusion which is a direct product that lies at the intersection of imperialism, colonialism, and, and racism. Um, I, uh, philosophy is an attribute of power, a definition that can be read in a different in a, in different, in a different sense, uh, whereby the practical lack of power, the state of subjugation, for example, equates because it exemplifies the theoretical and historical lack of philosophy. In this respect, the claim to philosophy constituted a decisive gesture in the action of reclaiming the humanity of the subjugator. But that is only half of the story, the other half being uh, what follows. There was uh, a side effect. Um, to the African endeavor, uh, first to claim to own philosophy in the plural, philosophy in plural, and second to claim philosophies of their own, namely the ideologized relationship to philosophy by which one of the only the name philosophy is rich, whereas the content of the term uh, is missed. This unfortunate outcome is what the Busin Bulaga called ethnophilosophy. In this latter enterprise, the colonial relationship to philosophy is maintained even in the idea uh, uh, of claiming to possess philosophy because of the rhetorical aspect of the attitude uh, that makes ethnophilosophy a plea whose addressee is the colonial master. Ethnophilosophy is grounded on the idea that African philosophy receives its philosophical character from its similarities, strictly reduced to the idea of formal resemblance with Western philosophy, what Abusi Bulaga calls in Muntin Prizes, concordism. This focus on the shape or on the form uh, of philosophy has undermined, according to Abusi Bulaga, the more important reflection on the very content of the concept of philosophy, which lies in the pretension, which can also be understood as a desire to be by and for oneself that excludes violence and arbitrariness this failure, which is that of which is that of not philosophy, is analyzed in the first part of the book. In short, um, the colonial idea of philosophy by which this discipline relates to power, that is also domination, is not to be accepted as such and uncritically without suspicion uh, or doubt. Rather, it must be subverted so as to reconcile philosophy with its concept in the African context, that is, in the face of the moon too. So, Ebusi's you know, inaugural uh, definition of philosophy as an attribute of Western power functions in Muntin Crisis as the keystone of his critique of the discipline that is philosophy. Um, so, depending on whether one relates to this discipline as a white and Western person or as an indigenous, subjugated, or colonized individual, this idea of saying that philosophy is an attribute of power. Uh, is different. So in the first context, uh, philosophy is part of the narrative of our emancipation as white and Western persons. And whereas in the second, the same discipline provides the ground for the justification of our, of our domination. So claiming that philosophy is an attribute of Western power is pointing that this discipline, contrary to what is taught in school, and when Ebu Sibulaga talks about school, he's referring, of course, to the school having in mind the colonial enterprise and context, is especially in Africa. So this idea of philosophy taught in school is not as pure, disinterested, uh, divorced from political reality, abstract as it seems. And it doesn't always go uh, hand in hand with emancipation, freedom, reason, uh, et cetera. So, from there, it follows that a colonial context is therefore a privileged site to see how philosophy has deviated from what is, what is presented as its main goal to coincide with subjugation. 
The second part of Muntun crisis is thus concerned with the critique of philosophy as a symbol of uh, domination. This critique culminates in the idea that philosophy is an institution. So by transfunctionalization, um, the, the term is used in French in La Crise Muntu, page 120, 128 and 124, among others. But in, the, in Muntu in crisis, the term is translated, it's not translated as such. So it's translated as a change of functions. So it's, it's absent from the second book, but I'm using the, I'm referring to the French book, as I told you in the, in the opening of the lecture, in the beginning of the lecture. So by transfunctionalization, Ibuzi Bulaga means the shift of function of a concept, mostly occurring according to the two examples provided by the author, namely that of philosophy and that of tradition, when an immense participatory or utopian function replaces a more conservative and oppressive one. So transfunctionalization can be further presented as the act by which an, immense, an emancipatory concept is reconciled with its truth content. The method of transfunctionalization is criticism by which one can identify and dispel the toxic spell of ideology. On this, idea of transfunctionalization that is applied to the concept of tradition. There's a very interesting uh, paper wrote by um, Mbusi Nyana uh, and published in the Cameroonian Studies in Philosophy, uh, number one in 2015. And there's also a great um, paper wrote by um, Hubert Vincent in 2011 and published in, uh, in Yaoundé. Those two papers are really interesting to grasp the, what transfunctionalization is about uh, in Ibu Siburaga. So, the transfunctionalization of philosophy should, should lead us, according to Ibu to the reuse of philosophy. So, according to Ibu the overcoming of philosophy is carried out by its reuse. As a philosopher, the Muntu a term that can be said to be the allegory of the human being under Western domination cannot be satisfied with the sole use of this uh, discipline by which they are used in return. Philosophy is certainly to be used, but this very discipline must be used in return instead of its sacrality preserved. Ibusi Bulaga calls this emancipatory result of the critic of, of philosophy, the reuse of the latter. So this idea of reuse of philosophy uh, appears uh, in the second part of um, the third part of Muntin crisis. So the success of the reuse of philosophies indicated by some elements and attitudes identified by Ibusi Bulaga in Muntin crisis. The first being the critical understanding of philosophy as a vehicle of Western domination. And the second being a critical relation to philosophy understood as an attribute of power by which what is intended is its demystification. So the demystification of philosophy is attested among other things by the establishment of a new topography of this discipline in which new modes of thinking, new interests, new preoccupations formally banned or deemed irrelevant are uh, introduced or reintroduced into the discussion. In doing so, claims Ebusi Bulaga, philosophy enters unexpected configuration and consolation as it rises in a Muntin crisis, page 124. So the question I now want to ask is still my third question, but I'm gonna rephrase it. So translated into the language of Muntin crisis regarding transfunctionalization, the last of my three questions uh, can be rephrased as follows. Does the reader notice a change of function with regard to philosophy in Ebu Sibulaga's Muntin crisis? So this is the most uh, decisive questions, question I want to ask this evening. And I am, I am tempted to give a negative answer to this question. So, to support this claim that uh, uh, there is nothing that's as the overcoming of philosophy in the in Muntin crisis, and that uh, Ibusi Bulaga fails to do so, 
Uh, I will mention only one argument, namely that of the topography of philosophy displayed in uh, Busi Bulaga's book. Um, there is another argument that touches on the place occupied by the Muntu in the book, which contrasts, um, which contrasts with uh, what is intended by the author, namely emancipation, as the Muntu is said to speak from another place than, what which, um, than that which one has been assigned in advance in a closed system or in a linear and predictable unfolding. Those are Ibusi Bulaga's words. So I want to ask, does the reader of Muntu in Crisis witness unexpected configuration and constellation when dealing with the book? Um, Hubert uh, Ben Sand recalled that uh, Muntu in Crisis situates itself within the tradition of philosophy, a position without which it would, be, uh, it would have been difficult um, to praise the book in the aftermath of his uh, publication as a great book. Um, so there are many examples of this, of praises uh, to, to Muntu in Crisis. And the, one of the early praises is that of uh, François Boyard. It's uh, a recension uh, published in um, a book review published in um, um, the Revue Française de France, the Science Politique, sort of French review of political science. In 1978, that is only one year after the book has been published. So, from that, it, it, from there, it follows that there was quite um, a seamless inclusion of the book and of its author in the realm of philosophy. And this inclusion, seamless inclusion of the book, speaks uh, of the fact that they both participate in the tradition of philosophy, as pointed out by uh, by Gervin Sam, in a sense which is not a controversial at all. Otherwise the philosophical reception of Muntu in crisis would have been a much more uh, complicated story. So my first argument relating to the topography of philosophy of, in, a, of, in Muntu in crisis is that first we can see and we can witness the fidelity of Ebu Sibulaga to the corpus of philosophy uh, with regard to the topography of philosophy depicted in, by Muntu in crisis. So, Considering proper nouns as distinctive markers of this topography, which can be extended to the topography of reason, one discovers that only a few people are named or referred to adjectively in the book. So those people are Aesopus, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Proclus, Marx, and to some, and to some, ex uh, to some extent, Lenin, James Clerk, Max, Maxwell, and Newton. So the, these are the people and those are the names from which we can draw the topography of philosophy and also the topography of reason uh, uh, in, Muntu, in, in Muntu in crisis. So because they are the, they are the only one named by Ebusi uh, Bulaga in the book, people have said, I've argued that they know, know there is no philosopher a name in the in the book, but it's not true. Those uh, six people uh, are all named in the book by their name or by adjective der der deriving from the names. So, when speaking about other authors, except from these ones uh, or doctrines, Ibu Bulaga exclusively uses mass noun such as negritude, or doesn't even mention them. It, either by the name or by adjectives or nouns deriving from them. For example, uh, and this is very, very telling example of the, this attitude by Ibusi Buraga. In the third paragraph of the preface opening the book, Ibusi confesses that he will be using the term ethnophilosophy coined by all the people, all the people without mentioning the, uh, the people from which he's taking the, from who he's taking the, the term ethnophilosophy. And of course, he is referring to Polon Untanji and to Marcin Toa because they were the first one to use the, the term ethnophilosophy in the context in which it is used in Mountain Crisis and it's used by Ibusi Bulaga. So in his response to Jean Godfrey Bidima, uh, who accused him of purposively obscuring his sources in 1993, so uh, Bidima published in 1993 a book entitled Theory, um, Critique and Modernité Negro African, in which he criticized a lot, uh, uh, most of African philosophers, as, um, and there's a special paragraph devoted to the critique of Busi Bulaga. So, in replying to, in responding to, to Bidima, uh, 
uh, um, Ibuzi uh, has, had, has claimed, uh, but on another case, uh, he was referring to the allusion to Saul Kripke in, uh, in A Contre Temps, that is a different, different book published in 1991, that the names that are absent from the Munjin crisis are so well known that they do not need to be mentioned any longer because everyone knows who the author is talking about. Uh, and that is exactly what Hubert Vincent says when he's trying to justify the scarcity of races in Munjin crisis. However, it is worth nothing that the philosopher's names explicitly mentioned in Munjin crisis are certainly much more known than those who are not mentioned. Because unless displaying, for example, some severe bad faith, no one can compare the philosophical relevance of the name of Socrates, for example, to the name of Maschento. So in that, the argument by common knowledge seems to be, uh, seems to be irrelevant uh, on this point. There's, there's more. Um, so on the other hand, um, Ebusi Bulaga is systematically oblivious of black, not to say non-white and non-European authors and philosophers, whereas this omission is not systematic regarding white and European thinkers who benefited from a, of a regime of exception with the mention of canonical names such as Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Marx. It is not difficult to see the function of mentioning these names in Munchen crisis. Indeed, they outline the tradition in which the book and the author inscribe themselves as legitimate participant in this history, which is claimed for themselves as a proof of their identity and also of their authenticity as the latter term relates to philosophy. But last, uh, but certainly not least, the topology outlined by proper names in uh, monitoring crisis, proper names who are considered properly, properly philosophical goes hand in hand with the display of power at work in monitoring crisis. In this book, Abusi Bulaga displays the colonial rule of commandment. And I'm using the concept of commandment uh, as a uh, Shimbembe in the, the La Post Colony, um, the book published in, in 2000 on post colony. When it comes to indigenous people who are forced to, to silence, the only exception being that of the author himself. So in Muntun crisis, we cannot hear the voice of a single Muntu except that of uh, Ebusi Bulaga himself. So a word of caution here, because I'm not saying that indigenous people are absent from the philosophical gesture of Muntun crisis, that Ebusi Bulaga doesn't refer to them and doesn't consider their knowledge. That's not what I'm saying. I'm precisely saying that in this book, Ibuzi Bulaga participates in the racialization of the indigenous who appears as the ghost of philosophy, a raw material to borrow from Achilles Mbembe's critic of black reason. Now the, capac the capacity to make visible or invisible is a specific attribute of power originally in the hand of the imperialist and the colonizer targeting everything identified as otherness. Um, in the African colonial context, the main target of this enterprise was the black individual. We encountered the same means and result in, in, and results in Muntun crisis, where the boundaries of philosophies are clearly set and rigorously established through a restrictive topography that rejects everything else at the periphery of its realm. At this point, it is noticeable that Muntun crisis aligns with its very own definition of philosophy. At, it demonstrates the master status, which is not only that of the Buzi Bulaga as claimed by Bidima, but also more broadly, that of the Western tradition of thought, the only one, according to the topology of the book, to be summoned in its inerrant, is in its inerrant philosophical quality. So, of course, this is not to say that um, this Western philosophical tradition is left unquestioned by Busi Bulaga, which is of course not true, but the centrality of this tradition makes it the pivot of everything coming after it as so to say um, commentaries or addenda. This particular stance is revealed by the author himself who describes 
as enterprise as follow, and I quote, the Ibuzi says, the enterprise of Imuntu in crisis, I quote, is to take upon himself the philosophical institution and adjust to it. Muntu in crisis, page 175. So how can we conclude this brief incursion in the Muntu in crisis, and especially in the critique of uh, philosophy um, uh, displayed by uh, Abu Siburaga in this book? So there are some tentative answers to our three questions. So the first and second question, what is the content of Ibuzi Muraga's critical understanding of philosophy in Muntu in crisis? We shall answer that the critical content is the collision with power. And to the third question, is the critical intention of the book fulfilled by the author? Or to put it more simply, does Ibuzi Muraga refuse philosophy in Muntu in crisis? The answer should be that the critical intention of Ibuzi Muraga with regard to philosophy is not fulfilled in Muntu in crisis. And this book, as this book is in itself changing the philosophy. So what then? So if in Moon, if in Moon to in crisis, the ambition or the pretension to overcome the, the sacrality of philosophy is not overcome, uh, is not realized, is not fulfilled, is it to say that um, there is no other book and no other gesture in which this intention is fulfilled? I don't think so, because I think there is a clear difference between um, what Ibuzi has done in Muntu in Crisis, that is in 1977, and what he has done in all the endeavors, starting with uh, um, Christianity without fetishes. And, and from, from that, from 1981, moving forward, we can see a shift in the way that um, uh, Ibuzi Bulaga treats the question of African philosophy. But that shift may be may probably be the, the subject or, uh, or the pretext for an, another lecture, not that of today. For now, I just want to thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Adolu. Uh, thank you a lot. Uh,